So you want to get into electronics and build two-band projects like I do, but you don't want to break the bank buying all the tools? Well, I got good news for you. I assembled this full electronics toolkit all from Harbor Freight for the cost of taking your family out for dinner. But honestly, I'm quite shocked how good it turned out. So today I'm showing you exactly what I bought, how much it all costs, and why these tools are perfect for a beginner or somebody who wants to tinker around without blowing your bank account. So I'll put a link to all the tools I purchased in the video description below so you can click the link and do a deeper dive on the specs. First up on the list is a soldering iron. So this is the Schneider quartered soldering station. And my recommendation is to go with a plug-in wall soldering station rather than a battery powered. You do spend some time at the bench and you don't want to be swapping batteries all the time. And with a corded one, you have some better control over the heat and the longevity of the iron. Now at $48, don't let the price fool you. It's perfect for the type of soldering we do in two amps. It is five to 50 watts, includes three tips, has variable control, and can go all the way up to 890 degrees Fahrenheit. The neat thing too, it comes with a stand and a sponge to clean your tip. This actually looks quite similar to my higher cost Haku one. So later in the video, we'll do an unboxing and we'll put this through the paces and we'll see what it's all about. So the second tool on the list is a multimeter. I went with the Centec 9 function digital multimeter and at $25, I think it's a pretty good deal for what we're going to encounter in most tube amps. Now there are different types of multimeters you can purchase, but the one thing you should consider is the voltage rating. This one is rated to 600 volts and that's pretty much what we would probably encounter in most tube amps. So if you're working on tube amps that has more than 600 volts, you may want to go with a different multimeter. So this multimeter can do AC and DC voltages up to 600 volts, a DC current, resistance, a diode checking, capacitance checking up to 10 microfarads, and it also has audio connectivity, which is really good for checking to see if your connections are sound. And at $25, I think this is a pretty good deal and it will do all the functions that you require to build the tube amps. They also have this real budget one as well, uh, but it's only rated for 250 volts. So basically this one is only really rated for checking resistance and checking your bias. I would not measure B plus with this one. Another tool you should consider getting is some way to clean up your solder joints. So you can get this solder sucker and wick kit. And pretty much what you do is the sucker, you heat up the solder joint, you push the button down and you squeeze it and it sucks up all the extra solder and this wick, well, you just kind of heat up the solder joint and you use this little copper end to suck up the extra solder and you just snip off what you don't need. Next tool on the list is a wire stripper. I went with this Doyle Professional Wire Stripper and Cutter. The cool thing about this tool is it goes down to 22 gauge. A lot of tube amp signal wires are 20 or 22 gauge and having the right size stripper to strip those is ideal. It is very frustrating trying to strip signal wire with uh, the wrong size tool or even a dull tool. This tool looks very reminiscent to my higher price Klein tool. So we'll give it a try later in the video to see how it compares. I also pick up this Pittsburgh Micro Flush Cutter. These are really handy and I find them a necessity when building tube amps. These are really good for after you solder, you can get right down to the tag board or the terminal strip and you can snip off any extra leads that aren't required anymore. The next set of tools that you wanna get is some small pliers to help you build the amplifier. These long needle nose pliers are good for getting deep into the amplifier and training some leads around terminal strips. I have ones that are bent, so it helps you get into those tight positions. And of course I got some snippers here that are good for like snipping off bigger wires or even terminal strips when you need to make them shorter. Another thing I recommend getting, very helpful for wiring amplifier, is these helping hands. So this is the HFT set. It comes with two adjustable alligator clips and a magnifying glass. I know some of you guys are getting a little bit older and your eyesight isn't as good as it used to be and you wanna make sure that you have a good solder joint because trust me, you'll probably encounter some cold solder joints and having something like this will help mitigate that issue. So next set of tool is this micro pick and hook sets. Now these are not really a necessity, but I do find them handy for training wire or even cleaning terminal strips that have too much solder. Sometimes what happens, you're soldering away and the hole in the bottom of the terminal strips gets filled with solder. You can heat it back up and you can poke it with this thing to reinstate that hole again. Some honorable mentions, which I didn't purchase, like this wire stripper. These are quite handy where they actually hold the wire and strip the wire back all in one shot. And of course, if you're gonna be using heat shrink, like this heat shrink here, 
you're also going to need a heat gun. Now I have multiple heat guns, so I didn't need to purchase any more, but you can see they also have various types of heat guns. The battery ones are okay, but I find that the plug-in ones do work better. That pretty much sums it up for what I purchased for a basic toolkit. And of course, you can enhance that as you go along, but you also want to consider the chassis itself. You also want to pick up a set of drill bits. So this is a full set all the way up to 3 8 That's really handy. And if you need to do bigger, I also recommend getting these step bits. These step bits are awesome and they go all the way up to an inch and 3 8 So you can pretty much drill out any tube socket that you need for one of these drill bits. I strongly recommend getting these. These are really handy and something that you should have in your toolkit. If you find yourself building a lot of custom chassis, I strongly recommend getting a punch set. This is a Pittsburgh 10 piece knockout punch set. Uh, it's pretty handy. It goes all the way up to inch and a quarter. That's a pretty size decent hole. It will do 10 gauge mild steel and it comes with a lifetime warranty. So that's pretty cool. Last but not least, I recommend picking up this T-handled reamer. These are quite handy for making those holes just a little bit bigger or cleaning up that burr around the hole so it doesn't snag or cut anything. So another honorable mention for some chassis work tools is a set of files. Now you can buy individual files or you can buy a file set. So the files I typically use are a flat file, a half round, a round file, and a square file. So if we go ahead and just add up all the tech tools here, it works up to about $150, bulk of the cost being the soldering iron and the multimeter. I've built many amplifiers with similar tools and you'd be surprised what you can put together. Now, if you're going with a kit or a proven design that has the schematic layout and all the voltages, you don't need an oscilloscope or a function generator. As long as you can read the voltages, make your calculations and it sounds good to your ear, that's all you need. So if we go ahead and add the fabrication tools, anywhere between $50 and $100, because I know some of you guys already have the tools that I listed, you could build your own amplifier on a flat plate like this. So it's an aluminum top plate with a wooden bottom. I've built many amplifiers like this and you don't really need any special tools. So let's go ahead and do a deeper dive on some of this stuff I bought. So let's take a closer look at this multimeter here. The batteries are included, so you have to take this cover off and they go behind there. So when you turn it on, it has all the functionality. So it has the volts DC, it has the volts AC, it has your battery power, so 1.5, 9 volt, it has your M readings, it has your microfarad, so it goes up to 10 microfarads, so you can check capacitors. It has diode testing and it has all your ohm readings here. It comes with a light, which is quite handy, and it also comes with its own little stand. So that's very handy when you're doing testing. So let's look at the probes now. They have a nice ergonomic feel to them. It has a bit of a malleable plastic, so they're not like a hard rigid plastic. And they also come with this protector over top of the lead. So if you're going into tight places, you don't have to worry about shorting anything else. So that's a nice touch. This is what comes with the multimeter. And I would recommend getting some additional leads, ones that actually have clips on. So you can clip on various components inside the amplifier to do some testing. I typically don't like to reach in the amplifier with both hands probing around. I like to ground one side off and then use the one probe to probe around. Or if you have a questionable amplifier, you can clip onto both sections, kind of stand back and flip the switch. I'm always nervous turning an amplifier on the first time and I typically go with this type of setup first. And then once everything's confirmed, then you can go to the probes and start probing around and testing your voltages. Let's do a bit of an unscientific test here. I have two resistors wired in series in the helping hands and I have my Fluke 115 meter. It's a pretty decent meter. And so we will test it in series here. And it just auto ranges to 6.558 and then 3.268K. So at 6.53, somewhat close. Now, since this has an auto range, we have to take it down to the next reading. And that's 3.249K. That's really close. So the difference could be just in the resistance and the wires itself. So I'm fairly confident that this will read resistance accurately enough. So while we're at it, let's test some DC voltages here. I have my 6J5 preamp sitting on the workbench here. I have both multimeters connected to the last filter cap in the power supply section right before the OD3 regulator. So we're getting some unregulated B+. Both multimeters are on DC. Of course, the Fluke is auto-ranging, so I can just set it to DC. Uh, the Harbor Freight one, I have to turn it to a specific voltage range. So right now I have it 600 volts or less. So let's go ahead and turn on the power and see how it measures. So we'll watch it ramp up and then it should stabilize as the tubes warm up. 
So both multimeters have been sitting here for about a minute now and they're just kind of scrolling back and forth and they're pretty much equal, maybe within one volt or half a volt of each other. So I would find that this Harbor Freight multimeter acceptable to measure B plus or DC voltage as well. If you want some more information about this 6J5 preamp that I made, I have a build video of this as well and I'll put a link in the description. Well, these feel pretty solid. It has a lock. You can cut six by 32 and eight by 32 machine screws. It has wire cutters and it goes from 10 all the way to 22 gauge. That's a pretty solid unit. Those feel very similar to my Klein. So let's give these a try. I have some 12 gauge, I have some 22 gauge, and I have some Cat5 cable as well here. So let's give this a little slice. Just fine. And kind of work that around, break the jacket. That works good too. So the 22 gauge, I guess this will work just fine as well. Slice it, we'll go right down to the last section there and go, oh, perfect, that worked really easy. So we have some Cat5 cable here. And so we'll go down to the 22 gauge. No, it doesn't work. So obviously this is smaller than 22 gauge, but we have the cutters here and I'm sure this will work just fine. So we'll just lightly go like that and we'll pull on it. So it seemed to work. Now, if you're doing a lot of Cat5 cable, I would recommend finding some cutters that go down to at least 26 gauge. So let's take a look what we have here. So on the base unit, we have a seven pin DIN connector here. We have our temperature gauge up to 392 to 896. It has an indicator light, so I'm gonna assume that flashes when it's at operating temperature. And we also have a calibration section here too. So if you had a thermometer, you could measure what's coming from the soldering iron, and then you could adjust that to meet whatever temperature you have this. It also comes with this base here. So this seems to be all plastic with a tin section here. Um, always kind of keep your sponge wet so it will retain all the water in that, so that's good. So let's take a look at the iron itself. Somewhat lightweight. It has about a three foot long cord on it. The grip section itself, it's somewhat of a hard molded plastic. Kind of nicely balanced in your hand there. For changing the tips, you don't need any tools. You can just unscrew that by hand. So that's a nice feature. And then it comes with two spare tips. So with the tip in the iron itself, you have three tips. So that's nice. So let's do a little test here. I have the soldering iron turned on to 800 degrees. I have a terminal strip sitting in these helping hands and on the terminal strip, I have a two watt resistor wrapped around the tip of the terminal strip. So what makes for a good solder joint is several things. Of course, you need a decent soldering iron where it gets up hot enough. You need a clean tip on your soldering iron and you also need some decent solder. And on top of that, you need to have a nice mechanical bond between your component and what you're soldering to. So I did a couple wraps around the end of the terminal strip. So let's see how it functions. Get it nice and hot, let it flow. There we go. Well, I'm pretty happy with that solder joint. So I think this soldering iron would do just fine. I've been using the solder station for a little bit here, and I must say for an entry level unit, it solders quite nicely. Some things I like about it is the wand. It's nice and light and compact, allows you to get into tight places. The tip, you don't need any tools to change it out, so that's handy. It has a nice solid base that it goes into and a place for your sponge, because you always need to clean your tip. Another good thing is it has adjustable heat. When I'm building tube amps in my soldering, I'm usually cranking up the heat, but if you had any discrete components, you can turn it right back so you don't risk frying anything. Some things I don't like about this soldering station is this grip. It's hard plastic, it's not very ergonomic. If I were to use this more, I'd probably change this out or put some heat shrink on there, a couple layers to make it nice and pliable. The cord is quite stiff. I wonder over time it might loosen up, but it's kind of irritating. It's not very pliable at all. When you're turning it on, so you're going from zero to full on temperature, it does take quite a while to heat up. If you're impatient, you might find that annoying, but once it's hot, it runs fine. All in all, for an entry level unit, I think you can't go wrong with this and you'll be quite happy with it. I paid for all these tools out of my own money. Harbor Freight did not sponsor the video whatsoever. I just want to show you guys that you don't need to spend a lot of money on tools to get into this hobby of building tube amps. I enjoy building tube amps. I enjoy sharing it with you and hopefully it inspires you to build similar projects like I do. Now, if you have any other tools at Harbor Freight that may be added to the list, please let me know. I'm going to keep a running list of tools so people can easily go back and refer to it 
print it off and maybe start building their own tool collection. And as for these tools, I'm going to gift these to my son because he's shown interest in building tube amps as well. So once again, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.